Good afternoon, everybody, or whatever time of day it may be where you're, when you're watching this. Um, welcome to the sixth symposium of the National STD Prevention Conference. This is Network Science, Unraveling and Harnessing the Mystery of STI Transmission Networks. Um, delighted to be moderating this session uh, along with my co-moderator, Dr. Catherine Town. And together, we're going to take you through four presentations uh, uh, from the work that CDC has funded but for the most part that has been conducted by our colleagues in the field. And we're going to lead off with one of my colleagues or one of our colleagues, Dr. Andres Baruti, an economist with ex ex expertise in health economics, epidemiology, management policy, theoretical modeling, and economic and statistical analysis. He has ample international experience. He's worked in 23 countries. And today he has he will be speaking about costs associated with incorporation of network approaches into STD program activities. Over to you, Andres. Thank you, Matthew. Um, well, first of all, let me uh, thank you, my co-authors. Uh, um, Samuel Epping uh, has been like helping a lot with the data collection and as well as the team from um, North Carolina, in particular, Jalila. Guy and Arlene Sina, uh, both actually has been super helpful. And then pretty much without a team from North Carolina, we've been like cracking numbers and doing and redoing and redoing. This is uh, was a little bit of a new study for them. Um, and I had to say, uh, as we start thinking about um, different uh, activities that we need to do for, um, for trying to get all those positive on STDs, I mean, we also have to think about the finance piece. I will let pretty soon talk about like background, a really short methodology to just make sure that everybody is uh, understanding what type of cost analysis we did here. And then uh, a little bit of the result and finally the conclusion. So um, let's go to that. Well, first of all, I mean, as we all know, the, the increase in, um, in, uh, in the needs for detecting positive, especially in, in high-risk population, is really important. But also, as I said, we all face like a budget constraint, and we need to make sure that we use the money in the, in the right uh, way. Uh, in terms of costing, uh, there is something that people think that they're not good things or bad things. They're really the best, they're the, the best use of resources, whether actually um, you spend too much money or too less money. So it is difficult to think about, like you can compare one study with the other one on the finance piece, if they use, if they have different approaches and then they use different um, a type of population and they use different methodologies. So we have to keep that in mind. There is no such a thing. I always said, like, unless you compare the same project, uh, there's not such a thing of like uh, a cost saving, uh, because sometimes cost saving is gonna be detrimental for the project. Uh, we prefer actually to think about cost effectiveness to be sure that we use the right um, a approach or with the, with the resources that we have, we just try to combine the resources in a way that maximize our, our outcome. Um, so in this particular project, what we did, we cost the a network approach. Um, the idea of, um, well, if we spend time and money actually in trying to find um, a, the network uh, associated with each of the peer, how resource consuming is that? And actually how much I get out of that? How many positive I get? And in the end, try to get some sort of ratio to uh, provide some information for the future, just not only for budgeting, but also for, for planning uh, purposes. Um, of course, that structure, uh, there's really not that much information around. So this pretty much is, is pretty new. Um, the good thing about this study is unlike others that we can actually sit on the desk and then make up, well, make up number, people will not like that, but it's uh, create um, with a methodology, start populating the information. 
the good thing about this, we went to the to the data, we went to the finance uh, information, and the information that we got is a really the real one. Um, so we use a, a retrospective cost analysis, uh, meaning that all the finance piece, everything that has been spent, we went back in time and, and said in that time period, it showed me all the invoices, all the money and resources of that, that have been spent. And then we classify and we aggregate by cost categories and then by programmatic activities as well. That happened actually in um, a, for a particular population, and I guess other speaker will talk a little bit more about the project, but this is specifically for MSN and trans women of color in North Carolina and specifically in those four counties, Guilford, Forsyth, Durham, and Wake. Um, the time frame was also specific, was February to um, October last year. And, um, and then um, this is a little bit, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it's kind of like, it's nine months, but some of the, the numbers will appear in that time frame of nine months. Um, and also we, we have to keep that in mind if we want to extrapolate that for a year uh, to multiply uh, accordingly for four thirds uh, to, to make sure that uh, you get to a year annual, although as an, as an estimate. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the outcome because I'm pretty sure there's another paper that they will talk more about that. But I mean, just just a very few uh, a items here. Um, we collect a sexual network of 31 uh, initial seeds, and then um, those produce 49 peers. Um, and then there was five cases detected for with HIV among those uh, peers, and then 10 cases of syphilis. Uh, that, that kind of like uh, as an outcome for, uh, for the project. Um, there was other characteristic that uh, at some point in our evaluation, his economic evaluation, there were um, peers that they became seeds. Uh, they agreed and that they became seeds. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the results. Um, it, as I said before, we have cost by category and then different, um, different cost categories. And then if you see in the graph, I don't know if you can see, I guess you can see now my cursor. Uh, I'm pointing to, to the cost categories that we have in the Y axis, personal laboratory supply, travel, buildings, utility and contracted service and equipment. Um, the total cost uh, is up to um, $190,000. That's actually for, keep in mind, from February to October, those are the nine months. If we actually want to think what would be an estimate for an, an annual cost for the same type of activity, again, it had to be an estimate because, as you know, different in times, maybe there was some part of um, a... Um, activities that they could happen and then it could affect differently the cost. But in, let's say like Ceteris Paros for the same type of activity, uh, the annual cost would be $145,518. What are the major drivers here? This graph actually gives a little bit like thinking about budget in a way. So if I'm doing this type of services, what what do I need? Obviously you need personnel and that actually that's actually the main driver of your cost. That's 80%. Um, and after that you see the lab is also important. And there are other support items, uh, including equipment. Just let me say one thing on equipment. Um, equipment uh, is uh, we, we actually annotize that, so it's just the use of the equipment for that time period. Um, and, and some of the items like buildings and utilities, they have been um, estimated um, according to what are the, the facilities that they were used. Uh, an average are across the four sides because they, they were not exactly the same, but the particularity was the program, although it was happening in four uh, counties, the program functioned as a rotating personnel, as a rotating resources. So that's why we did not use the unit of analysis 
um, each of the county, we have like one unit of analysis because they they share it, and sometimes even they share um, resources from one county to the other one. So things happen in one county could also move uh, on a second visit or something like that to, to a different county according to what is more important. Since personality is the highest or the biggest or largest um, item here, which is, I said, is 80%, um, uh, it's interesting to know what type of staff do you need in that program. In this particular one, 51% were patient navigators and non-clinical was the second largest one with 73%. Uh, obviously, as in any program, you need some management, and that management uh, required, like at least in that particular case, a 12% of the budget. Um, programmatic activities is something that um, um, that is important to know uh, because not only we need to understand are we spending money on salaries or on on uh, utilities and so on and so forth, but also. What are we doing with those um, items? I mean, uh, are we hiring like uh, nurses to do the nurse, the typical nurse activity, or are they doing more managerial stuff, paperwork and this kind of thing? So this graph actually give you a little bit of a better picture, how resources um, get around. Because you say like, well, it's great that you have personnel and you automatically figure it out like, uh, from the other, uh, there's a lot of patient navigators, there's a lot of clinical staff, that's great. And then program manager is 12%. But actually what are those navigators are doing is not 100% uh, clinical staff. The general administration, it is actually a big chunk of, um, of that money. And that's not only include in programmatic activity, not only include just personnel, but, it, but personnel is the biggest one, but also include other uh, um, are like laboratory and some, some and some other uh, items on the cost. So if you see general administration case management and services for HIV and syphilis, those are the two big chunks. But general administration is the largest by a little bit, but 37.5%. Uh, um, that's big actually. I mean, it's not right or wrong. I don't want actually to give like the, the idea that I'm judging the program. There's no right or wrong, different programs require different thing and then different programs are in different regulation. Just to, to, to finish now with the result and I want to move to the conclusion before uh, the end of, the, of, of my time here. Um, at the end of the day, and I said like those programs are important because we detect those positive out there. And then I think that's actually what makes the program powerful. Um, and this is just an indicator from the programmatic perspective and then from, um, from the policy makers. How much it takes, how many, how much resources, how many dollars does it take actually to get a positive or to, to, to find a positive, to detect a positive. Um, in, in this particular case, uh, $21,000 or $22,000 almost uh, for, to find a new HIV positive. Um, and then when you Think about syphilis detected, this goes to $11,000 per, per case. And then, uh, but obviously the, 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 the possibility of finding positive, it's, it's required too many other things like uh, the prevalence in the area, um, the stigma in the area and so on and so forth. So that doesn't mean that this is expensive or this is cheap. I mean, it really has to deal with, with, with the area. And, um, and, but it, 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 there is also in, enrolling people and testing people and, and so on and so forth. That, that is actually is an outcome by itself. And then that in general, I mean, it takes, uh, it requires like $2,000 to between $2,000 and $3,000 to, uh, to, to, to enroll people and, and find test them actually in that type of um, uh, situation. Um, one number that is not there, but I guess it's worth mention. Uh, a, think about like detecting HIV and syphilis, um, a, or detecting cases of uh, HIV and syphilis. The the, the cost per, per case is around seven thousand dollars. Something else too. Uh, in 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 particular, they're not like uh, a, we might think expensive for 
for um, the naked eye, but if you actually compare to the program, it's not really, they are really on the, on, on the ballpark. Uh, and again, it really has to do a lot with the situation in that particular counties. And, uh, and because obviously when the high, there is a high prevalence, really it's, it's much easier. And when the conditions are there, it's much easier to find uh, those positive. Just a few, a couple of more minutes, actually, I want to talk about in terms of conclusion. And I just want to make sure that, that the message is, is said there. Those, um, we, we mentioned how important it is actually to take those positive in, in this high risk population uh, pool. And then we know that it's costly, but it could be the case and think about that, that it could be uh, with all the limited um, a, a resources that we have, like maybe even that, that looks like costly, could be a good and crucial way actually to limit that spread of sexual transmitting diseases, diseases because something that is not in this um, cost analysis is actually the, 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 the further cost that to use a positive person in the community. So it think you have, we have to think about, probably that's the part for another topics, um, how much are we use saving for incurring that cost in, the, in, in saving um, in terms of like time, in terms of like diseases and treatment in the future. Um, uh, obviously, the cost of tap was the major driver. We talked extensively, 80%. And then um, the other thing is uh, the, the, the idea of, and thinking about that, uh, applying those type of, of, of programs probably could be, uh, if we're very targeted to the type of population, to the region, probably those could be very efficient actually, because they do provide a service, but I don't think, uh, first of all, not everybody has the budget to, to, to carry on those. And maybe not every single region and every single population is actually uh, efficient or, or, or effective on those type of, um, of um, a program. So that will be my, my, uh, my, my recommendation in the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bariti. And next speaker is Dr. Jackie Jennings, who is an infectious disease social epidemiologist at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her specific area is of interest is in determining the mechanism through which networks in place <laughs> is core virtual play a role in transmission dynamics, causing endemic rates of STI, HIV, and extreme racial disparities. She should also point out she has dedicated her career to working collaboratively with public health practitioners to translate evidence to practice, near and dear to the heart of many of those listening now, I am sure. Today, she will discuss how network data contribute to understanding the epidemiology of SDI transmission. Jackie, over to you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And a huge thanks during this time to all those that are working on the front lines. Just want to say, and that includes infectious disease epidemiologists. So here, here. <laughs> uh, so today we'll talk about how network data kind of uh, contribute to understanding the epidemiology of STI transmission. Okay, so STIs are not uh, transmitted randomly. The links between and among people have direct consequences for transmission and result in population uh, morbidity and mortality. Patterns of transmission depend upon who has sex with whom and the structure of sexual networks. Traditional methods of syphilis control, such as partner notification that are familiar to many of you, uh, or, or called contact tracing, are in part designed to address network transmission. And local health departments have traced uh, the partners of patients with, for example, syphilis since the 1930s for the purpose of treatment and prevention. Uh, there's a lot of contact tracing going on right now, as we're all aware. In addition, mathematical models have confirmed the importance of structure of sex partner networks and interconnection between network structures uh, for transmission. There have been a few common characteristics of sex networks that are recognized to facilitate the spread of STIs and HIV. The networks uh, have, a, for example, have a degree distribution indicating the presence of a small number of individuals or nodes with a large number of contacts. These nodes serve as foci for the clustering and distribution of disease. 
Uh, and the networks also have short pathways between nodes. Additionally, um, the larger networks all have had one uh, single large component. So together, these characteristics, these three characteristics, local clustering, short pathways, and one large connected component, as Rothenberg has stated, define the small world phenomena and interaction which transmitting networks seem to display. So each of these network characteristics taken separately may be necessary, but not sufficient to explain the properties of actively transmitting networks. Studies have found variability in disease transmission networks with similarly characterized networks. Um, in part, this may be because it is not just these characteristics alone that allow for active transmission. Rather, it is the combination and interaction of these network characteristics brought together in space and time that allow for active transmission. And indeed, another necessary element is infection and transmission risk. That is that there have to be individuals who are infected and then uninfected individuals for there to be transmission. Um, closer to, to the idea that uh, sexual networks in space and time are crucial, there are significant limitations uh, to the visualization and study of sexual networks and their structures. In order to create a valid representation of sexual networks and their structure, each member of the network and their connections have to be identified. And techniques uh, used for this have included standard health department contact tracing, as I mentioned. Also, they've included snowball sampling, respondent-driven sampling. Uh, and although each of these approaches is useful, um, often they fall significantly short of providing uh, a relatively complete image of the network. Often the missing links are informative links. Uh, they're either anonymous or casual sex partners, or they represent individuals uh, that, that may have a greater mistrust of government institutions and health departments um, and less uh, reliable locating information. And indeed, many of these studies have also not included a measure of infectiousness uh, and, and a term that I often think of uh, that was coined, um, I think by the Colorado Springs group is force of infectivity. So they haven't often incorporated the, the idea of the force of inactivity of a, of, a, of a transmission network. So given the elusive uh, nature of STI and HIV transmission networks and their structures, one solution is to study people in places. An effective strategy for accessing the areas of a transmission network where there are individuals with high viral loads, for example, or infectiousness and significant interconnectedness is to focus outreach efforts on uh, social or um, often called sex partner meeting venues. Uh, these can include, in, these are in places where individuals congregate and they can include bars, clubs, internet app, apps. They may attract individuals uh, with transmissible infection. They may also create opportunities for interconnectedness uh, that perpetuate incident infections. And they also provide then access for control activities, a super important aspect. So one means to identify potentially epidemiologically significant uh, venues is to utilize a variation on sexual network analysis. And that is, uh, so many of us are familiar with sort of traditional sexual network analysis. So this is a variation on that. Um, and compared to traditional sexual networks, the sexual network analysis of venues um, is about connecting individuals through where they go. So where they go to meet sex partners, for example. And the information, one of the advantages of using that approach is that uh, the information is less resource intensive to obtain, has fewer biases compared to other forms of sexual network analyses. So they may limit recall and disclosure of individuals. So just a quick illustration of what that means. We're very familiar with asking somebody who, who their sex partner was in the past three months, but instead this is asking, where did you meet your sex partner in the past three months? So there have been a number of studies that have used these techniques. Uh, this is a study by Fujimoto and team uh, published in STDs in 2018, where um, they, this was among 365 young uh, gay and bisexual, black gay and bisexual men aged 16 to 29, and they were recruited through RDS, Respondent Driven Sampling, um, uh, between 2014 and 2016 in two cities. And the objective was to assess network context and sexual behaviors associated with syphilis only, HIV only, and then co-infected uh, co individuals. And they found, interestingly, that syphilis only and co-infection was associated with a higher number of social venues attended. 
They also found that syphilis and HIV co-infection were associated with having network members who are co-infected or HIV infected within one social network. So again, sort of elevating the importance of social venues and networks. So we did three uh, venue affiliation studies in Baltimore City. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I'm gonna highlight a few results from, uh, from each of them uh, and show you how they sort of build on one another. So the first, the objective was to determine, um, and this was sort of a within analysis, and you'll see what I mean. It was to determine the extent to which newly HIV diagnosed MSM were linked through venue affiliation networks then to identify the structure, as we talked about network structures being important of that venue network, and to describe the variability of HIV viral load as a measure of infectiousness across the venue. And this, these were data, um, public health surveillance data uh, from newly HIV diagnosed MSM in Baltimore City from 2012 to 2019. If you're interested more in this, it was published in Social Science and Medicine. Um, so there are many network structural measures. I just show a few here. We measured a lot. I'm just going to highlight today degree centrality, um, which is a measure of, of connection to other venues. Um, so this is the beginning of the analysis. This is something that's kind of more familiar to everybody where we map individuals. And then in this case, we're connecting them to the venues that they nominated. So, um, this is an affiliation network of newly diagnosed MSM. There are 143 individuals represented here and they reported on 132 uh, uh, venues. And 48% uh, of the nominated venues were internet-based sites, 23% were bars or clubs. And that is consistent sort of through all of our analyses, that that is now where we're standing in terms of the prevalence of, uh, of online meeting spaces. This next one is, so it builds from the next. And here we only include venues uh, that are reported than more than one individual, because that is then how we get the connections between the venues. We've left the people in for now, just to give you the example of stepping through the analyses. Um, and... Uh, so, and in this case, one fifth or 26 of all the 132 venues were those that reported, were reported by more than one case. And they were linked to 79% or 113 of the total sample. Next is where it gets good. This is where we take away the people and we just leave the venues. And we show how these venues were at a higher level order of connectivity here. We're asking the question of how are the venues then connected to one another? And is, are, is that structure important? And does it give us information about the sexual networks and transmission that's going on? Um, so the venues are linked if they have at least one shared case. The size of the node reflects degree centrality. So that was that network measure I, I introduced earlier. So a larger node re represents more venue connections. Overall, the network was characterized by a high degree of connectedness across the venues. Venues were tied to an average of 5.5 venues, suggesting a large proportion of cases met sex partners at multiple venues. Venue Web 11, which is pointed out here, was the most central venue. Uh, and together with Bar 5, Web, uh, oh, I can use my pointer, that's great. Um, so Web 11, Bar 5, um, Web 15, and uh, Web 1, if I can find it right here, uh, together they represented 52% of all reports on venues. So a high, high degree of clustering. And here we added, added one more layer of information. I'm not really gonna dwell here. You can look at it in the paper, but what we added then was information. So for every viral load that an individual had that we had information on and we had um, uh, pretty complete data, we attributed that viral load information to the venue and generated a geometric mean viral load. And what what is striking is that, so 88% of the 26 venues, we could get a venue viral load on, and 95% of the venues were classified as high or moderate with a viral load of greater than 1,500 copies per ml, suggesting a lot of transmission potential here. So then our next uh, piece of work was to characterize venue co-affiliation network structures and examine transmission overlap. So here we were looking at HIV and syphilis together, 
We know that they co-occur very frequently among MSM, and we were asking, are these the same transmission networks, and can we demonstrate that in, in a venue affiliation network? And then we also did a sub-analysis to describe temporal changes during the course of, of, um, of uh, uh, when syphilis, early syphilis cases were increasing by 40% among MSM from a time period from 2014 to, sorry, 2010 to 2014. And here what you see, so a similar diagram, but now we've gone to the, the place where we're just mapping the venues and we're showing the connectivity uh, among the venues. Um, and here again, we're looking at uh, MSM who have been diagnosed with syphilis and or HIV. Here again, the size of the node represents degree centrality. And of the 57 unique venues, 86% were connected in one main network component. The color of the node represents the venue level diagnosis. So red is syphilis only nominations, that's 7% only. Blue is HIV only nominations, and that is 21%. And black was co-diagnosed nominations, or 72%. So it already suggests high overlap uh, going on between, between, these, uh, between the individuals nominating sex partner uh, venues. So next, we, uh, we sought to assess, to sort of measure that degree of transmission overlap um, between single diagnosis venues. Here we collapsed the HIV only and the syphilis only venues, and we compared those to co-diagnosis venues. And I'm just showing you one measure that we looked at, um, the degree centrality again. And what we saw was that single diagnosis venues had a significantly lower median degree centrality compared to co-diagnosed venues. And then here is that look over time, so temporality. What would we see when we look, and I'm just looking at one year, the beginning year to the last year, even though we looked at all of them in between, but for, for simplicity's sake here, um, you can observe in 2010, it looks visually incredibly different than 2014. Uh, many more connections in 2014 and many more venues that are uh, coded as black here or co-diagnosis venues. When we look to measure some of this, uh, what we find is that the total number of venues increased over that time period, 69%, and the degree centrality increased by 33%. So then this final piece, uh, we were very interested also in not just looking among MSM, but we were curious about networks and their permeability across different priority populations. So we often sort of silo out, and so the, first, the second paper, we often silo out in one disease or another, but we also often silo out in one priority population or another. But there's lots of questions about the permeability across those, and it's very difficult to look at that transmission uh, overlap. So here again, we look at venues uh, to, to determine where there's potential mixing between popul priority populations. Here we used uh, uh, four different priority populations, MSM, injection drug users, commercial sex workers, and youth. Again, public health surveillance data. This data is from 2009 to 2017. So this is a, this is a great one. Uh, this, uh, this is a crazy you know, diagram. And here, we're not quite at the synthesized venue only uh, uh, duly um, nominated venue level. Uh, but this is reality. This is what it really looks like. So it's kind of fun. I wanted to show you it. Um, and so the, for the first objective, we looked at this priority population mixing. The darkest blue nodes are venues that received nominations from all four priority populations and therefore represent the greatest potential for mixing. We see though across this uh, diagram that there is substantial heterogeneity throughout the network, but that overall 44% of all venues were nominated by two or more priority populations. Um, and 22% of cases self-identified as two or more priority populations, predominantly MSM and youth, which made up nearly two-thirds of these uh, intersectional cases. And if we were to limit the analysis to venues that received at least two case nominations, the, the diagrams we're more familiar with, we find that of the resulting 119 venues, 70, uh, almost 80% were sites of mixing. So we also looked at this in a slightly different way to sort of ease our eyes uh, and to, to help with the interpretability. This is a, a Venn diagram uh, that helps us look at the combinations of priority populations that were seen. So it shows the proportion of venues 
at which each combination of priority populations was seen. For example, 13% of venues received at least one nomination from a youth, 23% of venues received at least one nomination from an MSDEM, and 26% of venues received nominations from both youth and MSM. Uh, so this, uh, of note, nearly all cases that identified as both youth and MSM were located at two venues only, Instagram and a bar club 10, we, 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 um, we, nominate, we called it 10. So in conclusion, I'm not gonna go into, into specific conclusions about each of those papers. I think they were sort of self-evident and you can go to the paper to read them, but I wanted to go to, again, to a little bit higher level order on the conclusion. Um, infectious diseases, uh, I, I think it's, we all are pretty aware they, they work through networks. Uh, we're seeing that right now in, in current time and space with the pandemic in front of us. And these networks can be social, digital, sexual, molecular and that networks are fundamental to transmission and are likely more important than individual factors in driving onward syphilis and HIV transmission. And that um, network analyses and interventions for HIV and syphilis are intuitive. Uh, they make sense. I happen to be a visual learner, so for me, they really make sense uh, being able to map those things. Um, oops. And um, sorry about that. We'll bring it right back up. Um, and network analyses and interventions, uh, sorry, implementation that utilizes network interventions is key. Uh, and that consideration to include both sexual and social networks uh, to get ahead of the epidemic, decreased stigma and increased coverage should be considered. So lots of acknowledgements to lots of people that contributed to this. Uh, and uh, in particular, the CDC NEST study, um, we call it locally you shine. Uh, so I'm the PI at the local Baltimore site, and that's partly what funded this work. And you'll see more coming out of NEST very soon. We have a wonderful cohort of um, gay and bisexual men. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jennings. Our next speaker is Dr. Preeti Patala. Dr. Patala is with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Bureau of Sexually Transmitted Infections. As the Director of Research and Evaluation, she oversees a unit comprising analysts who examine data on STI and HIV patterns among the program's sexual health clinic population, as well as at the citywide level. They generate and answer research questions around STI and HIV risk and prevention. Her presentation today is focused on elucidating sexual networks, primarily related to syphilis transmission in New York City, the presentation highlights the program's case investigation and partner services work and provides information that can be used to guide resource allocation. Hello, I'm Preeti Pathela with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for this opportunity to talk about our work around understanding network dynamics among specific populations disproportionately affected by STI, specifically syphilis and HIV in New York City. Our efforts to characterize these networks take place in the context of a CDC-funded project, Matrix, the aim of which is to implement STI and HIV prevention interventions among gay, bisexual, and other MSM and transgender women who, report, who belong to minority racial and ethnic groups and are diagnosed with or at risk of syphilis or HIV infection, with the ultimate goal of decreasing HIV and syphilis morbidity and reducing health disparities. This graph shows increases in primary and secondary syphilis case rates in New York City over time. PMS syphilis rates in 2018 exceeded overall U.S. rates and Healthy People 2020 goals. The approximately 2,000 reported cases that year were overwhelmingly among men, and the vast majority of these patients reported sex with men. We have persistent racial and ethnic disparities with regard to reported male PNS syphilis cases, with Black and Latino men having sus substantially higher rates compared to other race and ethnicity groups. Given steeply rising rates of syphilis among MSM, and more specifically MSM of color, as well as a biological and epidemiological synergy between syphilis and HIV, improved strategies to reduce the risk of STI are needed. The two maps on this slide show the number of male PNS syphilis cases diagnosed or reported by healthcare providers throughout the city, stratified by race and ethnicity. The dots represent locations of diagnosing providers, with the black dots being health department sexual health clinics, and the gray dots other providers. 
Larger dot sizes signify larger numbers of diagnoses. Diagnoses among white men shown in the map on the left are concentrated in and around Manhattan. For non-white men, the map on the right, syphilis diagnoses are reported by providers who are more widely dispersed throughout the five counties of New York City. And notably, the eight, eight health department clinics light up as being important sources for diagnosis and treatment for these subpopulations. Given the role of sexual health clinics in providing care for sexual and minority populations, our clinics were considered prime settings for implementation of the Matrix project. We have eight clinics from which we chose two for the project. About one quarter of patients at the Corona Clinic in Queens are MSM and over half of patients are Hispanic Latino. Another 13% are non-Hispanic Black. The Riverside Clinic in Upper Manhattan sees more MSM patients and over half of patients are Hispanic, Latino, or Black. Prior to Matrix, our understanding of syphilis networks in New York City was limited due to historically low contact indices. With this project, we established enhanced case and partner investigation activities that have focused on uncovering networks of MSM and transgender women with newly diagnosed HIV or early syphilis infection and the collection of detailed social and sexual risk behaviors for them that one, enables the treatment of infected partners and opportunities for high impact STI HIV prevention among them, their sexual partners and social contacts. Two, results in the collection of granular risk factor data to inform our understanding of transmission dynamics and STI control recommendations. And three, collect sexual and social network data to improve scientific knowledge by enabling an understanding of network structures. With traditional case investigation and partner services, we attempt to interview a person with a newly diagnosed infection and elicit and notify their partners of possible exposure and the need for testing. With Matrix, the enhanced investigation entailed eliciting information for partners of partners to the original patient, recede, irrespective of the immediate or first generation partner's incident infection status. In other words, the first generation partner could be found free of infection and their partners would still be elicited. Any person in the chain who tests positive for early, syphilis, early stage syphilis or an incident HIV infection becomes a seed and starts the chain of first and second generation partner elicitation and notification all over again. For those experienced in health department case investigation and partner service activities, the diagram on the left side of the slide will look familiar. Staff identify patients for interview, provide appropriate prevention services, and elicit and notify contacts and offer them prevention services. In New York City, disease intervention specialists, or DIS, also frequently cover clinic duties. With Matrix, selected DIS conducted in investigations for patients in our subpopulation of interest who were diagnosed in our Corona or Riverside clinics or were diagnosed by other providers and assigned for investigation to the DIS at these two clinics based on patient residence. As I mentioned, second generation partners were pursued for investigation and the investigations included much more detailed interviews than the regular CDC interview. Important components of our project were the offer of incentives, a $30 gift card per interview, and the fact that these DIS did not have to cover for clinic. They were completely dedicated to the activities of this project. Matrix launched in late 2018, and improvements in 2019 syphilis interview rates and contact indices were observed. The interview rate for patients who qualified for Matrix was 85%, compared to between 40 and 50% pre-Matrix, and during the time of Matrix, but among patients diagnosed with the other six non-Matrix clinics. The, ind the contact index almost doubled, and about half of seeds named at least one partner, compared to about one-third prior to Matrix, or among patients not from clinics where Matrix was implemented. In 2019, we had 409 seeds. These were patients diagnosed with early syphilis or newly diagnosed HIV in Corona or Riverside clinics, or who were assigned to the DIS and those two clinics for investigation, as well as partners invest identified with these diagnoses as a result of DIS investigation. Less than half of seeds named sex partners. Because individuals could have named some partners and have others who remain unnamed, in other words, these are not mutually exclusive categories, three quarters of patients also had unnamed partners, and almost half of them had anonymous partners. A total of 451 partners were elicited, 49 of which were seeds who were named back. And of those who were interviewed, only 43 or 12% named partners. Because relatively few social contacts were identified, forthcoming results focus only on sex partners. 
Here we have our network of 622 people consisting of 409 seeds shown here in the orange and uh, 213 named partners displayed in blue for whom our DIS attempted investigation. Partners newly diagnosed with syphilis or HIV were new seeds, so included in those with orange shading. The vast majority of seeds had early syphilis infections. A total of 25 were newly diagnosed with HIV. About half of the individuals in the network did not name partners. This is shown in the table as component size one. There were 35 dyads representing 11% of the network, and you can see the remaining sizes of clusters in the table, with the largest single cluster containing 52 members. As a reminder, our seeds were MSM or transgender women. We had very few transgender individuals in our population, and not surprisingly, virtually all individuals identified as men. The five women we had were named partners, one of which was diagnosed with syphilis and became a seed. Overall, just over half of individuals identified as Hispanic, Latino, or Black. There were no major differences between seeds and partners with regard to gender, age, or race and ethnicity. So again, mainly we are looking at early syphilis infections in this population, um, which is 94% of all diagnoses. Of the partners, almost two-thirds were not evaluated, meaning that they were not locatable, refused to interview, or refused the offer of testing. The remaining roughly one-third were evenly split between getting HIV and syphilis tested as a result of their matrix-associated investigation. Um, and being evaluated and getting presumptively treated or indicating to our, our DIS that they had been recently tested and treated if necessary. 41% of seeds with syphilis were people living with HIV infection, which was higher than the proportion of partners with prevalent HIV infection, which is 23%. So more partners were not known to have been diagnosed with HIV, and we noted that for a much lower proportion of them, just over 1 in 10, we had evidence of current PrEP use. However, because we had substantial numbers of partners who were not interviewed, we also have gaps in our knowledge of PrEP use among them. Notably, one-third of all people were reported to us with chlamydia, gonorrhea, or a new or repeat syphilis infection after their 2019 matrix investigation, which was within a relatively short time frame after matrix, um, only through June 2020. Here we have network members with their HIV status indicated by squares for those with prevalent infections and circles for those not known to be living with HIV. Layered on top of this are the new syphilis and HIV infections that led to their inclusion in the matrix investigation. The gray squares and circles do not necessarily translate to people without these infections. Rather, many were not tested because they were not evaluated for for the need for testing, often because they were not able to be interviewed at all. And here depicted in black, we have indication of how many were evaluated for these new infections of interest and their positions within the network. Honing in on details of a few of our clusters, this is one of the larger ones with 32 individuals and one that was characterized by very low partner testing levels and low prep use. We started with an investigation of a seed with secondary syphilis who identified nine partners. One partner tested positive for early latent syphilis and did not name the original seed but identified 10 other partners, two of whom provided information on additional partners. Of 30 partners, only six or 20% were evaluated. Five were tested and were negative for syphilis and HIV. The lack of interview and further evaluation points to, in many instances, the need for better locating information. All 32 individuals had either a negative or unknown HIV status. Only three were known to be on threat. Here we have our largest cluster with several second generation partners, but an exceedingly low number of new infections identified. The original seed was an early latent syphilis case represented by the circle in the center, who named 27 partners. Of 51 partners, half were evaluated. 10 were tested for syphilis and HIV, two partners tested positive for syphilis, one named the original seed, and neither provided information about other partners. In this cluster, almost half of individuals were known to be living with HIV. Half of them were virally suppressed. Of the others with negative or unknown HIV status, about one quarter were known to use PrEP. And finally, an eight-person cluster characterized by a substantial proportion of new syphilis infections. A primary syphilis case with high vi HIV viral load, over 10,000 copies per milliliter, identified four partners. Two of them were living with HIV infection. One was on PrEP, one was not on PrEP. The high testing rate in this cluster yielded a number of new syphilis diagnoses. Notably, one first-generation partner with early latent syphilis may have been the source of infection for the original seed with primary 
syphilis and a second generation partner who tested positive for primary syphilis as well, though the original seed was linked to two other early latent cases. So there were several possible exposures, uh, poor sources of exposure here. Half of all individuals were living with HIV. None were virally suppressed. Half of the people in this cluster were also diagnosed with syphilis, chlamydia, or gonorrhea subsequent to investigation for the current infection um, or exposure. And given risk for HIV transmission associated with detectable viral load among HIV positive partners, the high burden of syphilis in this cluster, and additional STI that was continuing to be di diagnosed, PrEP use in this cluster would have been key. However, half of the individuals with a negative or unknown HIV status were on PrEP. We looked at a few characteristics that could be associated with more success in terms of partner interview. We found that a higher proportion of first generation partners were able to be evaluated compared to second generation partners, as were people living with HIV and those aged 30 years or older. Interview success was observed to be lower for those of non-Hispanic, Latino, white, race, and ethnicity. Success in reaching partners, of course, has direct impact on case finding. Half of first generation partners and one third of second generation partners were able to be evaluated for new infections. Um, a fair proportion of each set was diagnosed and this resulted in 73 syphilis and HIV infections identified across the sets, which may be infections that would have otherwise gone, gone undiagnosed for some time. However, it still is a relatively small number given the numbers we started with and the time and effort spent by health department staff in case finding. With this project around enhanced partner services, we have observed improved, nearly doubled, interview rates and contact indices as compared to metrics associated with routine case investigations and partner services. We think that incentives may help and are in the process of evaluating their impact by comparing these metrics for subsets of people who were offered incentives versus not. Despite improvements in contact elicitation, there are many missing links in constructed networks and areas for improvement that remain or in utilizing methods to ascertain better locating information. There are people um, in certain groups who may not perceive themselves to be at risk of infection and therefore less willing to cooperate with disease investigators or get tested. For example, partners of partners who may feel um, removed from the core groups, particularly if they have information on their partner's negative infection status, and we need to find better ways to engage them. Presenting network data we have here in a digestible way may be a useful tool. Finally, some interview partners refuse testing and we have to reduce barriers that may be related to access and convenience. Rather than clinic-based testing, HIV field testing and STI HIV at home tests should be considered. Meeting at-risk individuals where they are may be important for starting them on prevent prevention interventions such as PrEP as well. Um, so in closing, I'm grateful to our team at DOHMH for their hard work, Alexis, Kimberly, Brian, and our five matrix project DIS, and to Matthew and Patricia at CDC for their support. We look forward to sharing many other findings from this project, including those from the in-depth interviews in forums in the future. And here is my contact information, and thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Patella. Our next speaker is Dr. Emily Lerner. Dr. Lerner is an epidemiologist in the Epidemiologist, Epidemiology and Statistics branch within the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. She works primarily on the CDC's Strengthening the Response to Resistant Gonorrhea Project, which is known as SURGE, and examines data from SURGE to better understand risk factors and spread of antimicrobial resistant gonorrhea. Today, she will discuss strengths and limitations of sexual networks derived from partner services data and will present examples from gonorrhea partner services. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm Emily. I'm an epidemiologist at the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. Today, I'd like to talk about networks that can be derived from partner services data. I'll start by reviewing components of partner services as a network approach to STD prevention. Then I'll touch upon some of the challenges of applying network approaches to partner services, and I'll go through some examples with gonorrhea partner services data. I'll end with some successes and ways forward. I'd like to start with a review of partner services and networks. Partner services and networks are inherently linked. One of the goals of partner services is to use a contact tracing approach to find persons with STIs. We then provide treatment for the STI and elicit sexual partners interview and screen, and if needed, treat partners. 
And by treating and tracing sexual partners, we hope to address the source and spread of infection and interrupt onward transmission. So here's a short example of how that might work. In this example, we've identified a person with an STI shown here in red, and they've named one partner shown here in black. We locate and interview the partner and test them for STIs and find out that they are positive. We then elicit partners from them and they name three new partners. We continue forward and test the partners and find that one is positive. So we elicit partners from that person and they named two new partners. One of those is positive and that person names one new partner and so on and so forth. As we identify new people who are positive, we try to provide treatment. And the hope is that with treatment, we are stopping any future transmission events. By trying to prevent future transmission events, Partner Services is intervening on the transmission network for an STI. In addition to trying to tap into a transmission network and break future transmission events, partner services are also helping us map out sexual networks. So for example, sexual networks might tell us how similar or dissimilar different clusters are with respect to certain characteristics. They might tell us how connected or how complex a network is. And they can also tell us about roles within a network. Are some people in a network key players do they bridge different clusters together or are some people more influential than others? We can also try to understand an individual's risk or how an individual's risk is impacted by the network. But making inference from partner services networks can be challenging because networks are incomplete. All networks suffer from incomplete data, but networks from partner services have unique limitations. One is that they are generally biased towards cases. We follow the trail of infected people and follow up on their partners. And in that sense, we've biased towards people with infection. We also tend to start investigations when people present to care. So access to care becomes an important sampling consideration. Second, partner services generally captures a cross section of time. But as we know, sexual networks are dynamic and constantly shifting as partnerships form and dissolve. And then lastly, we have a missing data problem. The networks that we see depend on who is named and who is located. So I'm going to narrow in on this missing data issue. One thing I've been interested in is what this missing data looks like in real life. Do we have any sense of what we're missing and the implication of what's missing? We've been exploring this problem of missing data using gonorrhea partner services data. And I'm going to go through a few examples using data from a project called Strengthening the US Response to Resisting Gonorrhea, or SURGE for short. SURGE is a rapid detection and response program for resisting gonorrhea overseen by the CDC and eight jurisdictions participate in SURGE. SURGE has several core activities that center around control of resisting gonorrhea. One core component of SURGE is to detect and respond to gonorrhea with reduced antimicrobial susceptibility using partner services. The idea here is that if we detect a rare resistant strain of gonorrhea, we can use partner services to trace contacts and stop the spread. So under SURGE, partner services investigations begin when a person is found to have gonorrhea with reduced susceptibility to azithromycin or cephalosporins. I'm going to go through some preliminary partner services data from one of the surge jurisdictions. These data were collected in 2018. The dots here called nodes represent unique patient or partner events. And the lines between the nodes or links represent named partnerships where one or both people named the other as a recent sexual partner. Nodes that do not connect to any other nodes are singletons and these are people that did not name any partners and were not named as partners. We'll look at several layers of this network. Here, nodes are divided into two colors, red and blue. The red nodes are index patients in surge. These are patients that were found to have gonorrhea with reduced susceptibility, and they prompted the start of partner services investigations. 
Blue nodes are partners that were identified through partner services investigations. And the lines between the nodes represent named partnerships, where one or both people named the other as a partner. What we can easily see here is that around 70% of index patients did not name partners. Now the reasons for this are varied. In some instances, patients could not be interviewed and in others, patients declined to name partners. But this is a large part of the sexual network that we are unable to capture. However, not all of these index cases who did not name partners are the same. If we dig a little deeper, we do have some clues to what the unobserved network could look like. Some patients did not name partners, but they did report the total number of recent partners. So in this slide, the size of a node is weighted by the number of partners that were reported by a patient. Some nodes are bigger than others, indicating that this person reported more partners. So for example, the two biggest nodes represent index patients who reported over 20 sexual partners. But this is rare. Most index patients reported two or three partners. Now we don't know where these unnamed partners would fall in this network map. They might be nodes that we already see on the map or they might be new nodes. We also don't know if these unnamed partners link to other partners but the unnamed partners are still useful because they can give us an idea of the potential bounds of missingness. Finally, once investigations start, some partners are unable or unwilling to be interviewed and screened. And these amount to dead ends in the contact tracing protocol and investigations cannot continue. So in this map, partners in purple are partners that cannot be interviewed. Why do we care about this? Well, missing data can diminish our ability to interrupt transmission. If we can't reach people and provide treatment, we can't stop transmission events. Additionally, the sexual network that we see may not be an accurate representation of the true network. Now that might be okay because we're trying to observe important components of the network that we may want to try to understand. Um, but we may be missing out on other important components. And then finally, missing data may lead to biased network measures, which could lead to biased inference. So what can we do about the missing data? Well, there are several different analytic approaches to try, some of which involve trying to estimate the amount of bias due to missing data on network measures. And there are a number of examples in literature, but two that I've listed here, Smith et al. and Ghani et al. are two that use HIV and STI contact tracing data to examine bias on network measures. And we can also try to address missing data by improving data collection. And we've been exploring two data collection approaches in SURGE. The first approach we're exploring is whether enhanced investigations help us tap into new parts of a network that would otherwise go unmeasured or that we would miss. In enhanced partner services, we still follow the usual partner services protocol where partners of index patients are interviewed and tested and partners are elicited from any person diagnosed with gonorrhea. The enhanced component additionally involves eliciting partners from persons who are identified during the investigation but do not test positive for gonorrhea. So essentially, we're eliciting partners from gonorrhea negative persons who are found during the investigations. The hypothesis behind this is that perhaps going out a few steps beyond our normal investigations will help us increase case finding or reveal clusters that we don't normally see or interact with, but they're important to reach. So here's an example. This is more preliminary data from 2018 from a second surge jurisdiction. Red nodes here are people who were gonorrhea positive, black nodes are people who are gonorrhea negative, and gray nodes are people whose gonorrhea status is unknown. This is a network that we see under standard partner services. And this is the network that we see under enhanced partner services. So the additional nodes and links under enhanced partner services are highlighted in yellow. 
You can see that enhanced partner services helped a little to add to the network, but it did not lead to large clusters or substantially higher case finding. In addition, these extra investigations are quite a lot of work to complete. So a second approach we're exploring in Surge is whether we can combine epidemiologic and genomic data to better understand networks and what we might be missing. In Surge, we attempt to collect an isolate from any person who has gonorrhea and we're able to perform whole genome sequencing to examine genetic relatedness. Katie Town is leading this work in Surge to understand how networks derived from partner services data can be augmented by networks derived from genomic data. Dr. Town examines phylogenetic data and SNP differences to determine whether two isolates are genetically similar and examines how this may supplement what we see with partner services data. So we'll move through an example. Here's the same network from a surge jurisdiction that we saw previously. We're going to zoom in and focus on the clusters in blue on the right. When we examine only partner services data, we see that there are four distinct clusters and four singletons or people who did not name partners. When we examine genetic similarity of isolates from persons with gonorrhea, we see that many isolates are genetically similar, indicated by the lines in pink. And when we layer genetic data on top of partner services data, we move from four distinct clusters to one larger cluster. Now it's important to note that these genetic links and the lines in pink do not necessarily imply direct transmission or sexual partnership between nodes, but they do provide another clue in understanding network structure and connectivity. This work is still in the exploratory phase and we look forward to seeing how it develops. So to wrap up, partner services data and networks from partner services have been and continue to be a rich data source that should be explored to help us understand populations and maximize uh, potential to deploy interventions. But as with all network studies, missing data are important to understand before we analyze and interpret data. Understanding what data are missing can help create opportunities for new approaches to reduce that missing data and to better understand the true network as well as help us understand the potential impact of missing data on what we infer from networks. I'd like to acknowledge the jurisdictions participating in Surge. Surge is a large, complicated project and each jurisdiction completes a phenomenal amount of work to keep the project running. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the Surge DIS who have the very difficult job of conducting partner services. And they really do a fantastic job of providing services to individuals, as well as ensuring that the data we receive are high quality. There are also a number of individuals within the Division of STD Prevention here at CDC who helped with different parts of this presentation. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you to all of our speakers today. Please join us for a live Q&A with the speakers on Friday the 18th of September. And thank you very much for listening.